Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is part two of the case conceptualization lecture based on chapter two in my book, Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy. So now that we've got the basic couple subsystem assessed, we're going to move on to looking at the parental and familial subsystem. And so here you've got a choice between either um, assessing the family appropriation, so that's if you're seeing the client and uh, assessing them and their children, or the family of origin in which you're looking at your client in their relationship to their parent. And you should just pick the one that makes the most sense to assess for that particular client given their presenting problem. And as we go through this, we're going to kind of assess who is members of the parental subsystem and the various subsystems that might be important within the family. We're going to look at the hierarchical relationship between the parents and the children. We're going to look at the emotional bonds and boundaries um, between the parents and children. We will look at the interaction pattern, similar to what we did uh, with the couple assessment. We'll look at triangles and coalition and communication stances, again, similar to what we did with the couple. Now, when we start assessing the family subsystem, particularly the boundaries between parents and children, the first thing you want to think about is who is part of the parental subsystem. And the whole concept of sus subsystems um, really came most notably out of the structural therapy approach. And in this uh, approach, it's really helpful, they make this helpful distinction between the parental subsystem and the couple subsystem. In most cases, um, the same two people are part of part of both systems. And so there's the couple, and often they are the parents for the child. So at some point, at least in the family life cycle, generally the couple and the parental subsystems are the same. And and yet these are two subsystems that function differently. And so it is possible that the cubs, you know, within the couple subsystem, there's even one set of logic and boundaries and even communication patterns and interaction patterns, and that within the parental subsystem it can be different. Um, nowadays, when you start thinking of uh, parental subsystems, it's very possible that there are other people in the subsystem besides the two biological parents. There are often step-parents involved. There can be grandparents who are doing a significant amount of parenting. And you can also sometimes see older siblings part of the parental subsystem. Sometimes this is part of a cultural norm, and sometimes this is a problematic pattern. It just depends. So you want to step back, and when you uh, are assessing the family and asking who is actually doing the parenting of the children in the system. Other um, subsystems that are important to identify is, are if there's sibling, sibling subsystems and how those might be working, if there are any issues within that, especially when there are a lot of um, maybe step siblings or half siblings. Um, actually, sub sibling subsystems can get more and more complicated, especially as family uh, structures get more complicated. You might want to identify any special interest subsystems, such as gender or sports or music, because sometimes families end up organizing themselves around these um, special interest subsystems, especially a lot of traditional families will have very uh, gender stereotype roles. You know, the women do these things together and the men do these things together. Um, so those are some of the things you want to think about when you start identifying just what are the important subsystems within the family. Another early thing to assess when looking at the family structure is the stage of the family life cycle. And so in theories such as strategic and structural, satir growth model, symbolic experiential, these theories use the stage of family life to help conceptualize what is going on in the system. And generally, each stage is seen as needing a rebalancing of both the independence and interdependence within the system. So for example, as you know, when kids are infants and young children, there's a lot of inter interdependence between the parents and the children. And as those kids move through preschool, school age, adolescence, and then launch um, into adulthood, that increasingly there is more independence on the part of the child and less interdependence, or a different look way of looking at the interdependence within the family system. So the um, there are several different variations on the family life cycle, and the one um, uh, we're using here is first looking at the first stages leaving home, so a young adult, then they get married, um, which is a period of definitely rebalancing um, the balance of independence versus interdependence, then looking at families with young children, families with 
adolescents, launching, launching children, which often um, can actually have a boomerang effect. Um, oftentimes kids may go to college, then come home, may go off to college again, may come back again. Um, so that's often a you know, many that particular phase can go back and forth a few times, and then families in later life where the parents are older and needing care often from their children. So identifying where the family is in this cycle can be very helpful. For example, a lot of families come in with children um, in between the families with young children stage and the family with adolescent stage, and it can be very helpful to to identify, hey, this family is having difficulty transitioning from one stage to another, whereas families move into adolescence, parents who may have been very successful setting boundaries and you know creating structures for young children may have a lot more difficulty kind of transitioning with their children's um, need for growing and growing need for independence, um, taking more risks, and so that kind of and teenagers often wanting to assert their identity. So sometimes families are coming in or as families are trying to transition around this period. And so it can be helpful to, to have that understanding of the family developmental stage when you start working with the family. Okay, so if I've bored you up to this point, I really want you to perk up and pay attention because anytime you have some parent bringing in a child because of behavioral problems, under the age of 18 generally, I think we can run it up to about that far, but it's certainly up to the age of 12. Often what you are, what is going on and the most important thing to assess and identify is the hierarchy between the parent and the child. This is a set of ideas that comes um, through structural and strategic, it's most frequently used, but this can be very helpful in understanding child behavioral problems. And so when you're looking at the hierarchy between the parent and the child. You're, I know in today's society we don't like hierarchies and all this good stuff, but when it comes to a parent and the child there does need to be an effective hierarchy for lack of a better assessment term. And what that means is that when the parent is able to establish rules and enforce them and that there's clear division of power and labor between the parent and the child. And so, and this this hierarchy you know, does adjust throughout the course of childhood and adolescence, and it does get reduced and re renegotiated in different ways across the family life cycle. But it's very important that there is an effective parental hierarchy. So let's look at, and when there is a, an effective parental hierarchy, I would say that kids listen and parents are able to easily manage their child's behavior, let's say 90 to 95 percent of the time. It's, you know, you don't want this 100% compliant child who never once, you know, steps outside the boundaries. I would say that there's potentially a problem there, actually, with the hierarchy if the child's 100% compliant. Um, there, there is going to be a developmental norm of testing limits, but, but 90 to 95% of the time, the parent should be able to manage the child's behavior. Um, generally speaking, depending on, of course, there are going to be periods where things are a little worse or better with changes and la 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 la, but for the most part, the parent is able to manage the child's behavior. So let's look at, um, uh, so we've discussed basically what an effective hierarchy is. An excessively, an excessive hierarchy is when the parent uses a more authoritarian approach where there is too much hierarchy. The parent is too rigid. There are too many rules around too many issues and there isn't enough freedom for the child to develop as needed and to develop their sense of individuality and independence. On the opposite end here, we have the insufficient hierarchy, where the parent is far too permissive. There aren't, there isn't enough rules, structures, consistency, consequences, um, and the child actually has too much freedom and isn't learning to develop normal, normally in terms of just social norms, um, behavioral norms. So, I mean, today in my practice, I see a lot of insufficient parental hierarchy, and that seems to be where our culture tends, tends to err on that side. Um, and so a lot of what I deal with in my private practice is helping parents set up a, um, effective hierarchies. Now it's important, and why this is so important, is like a parent can bring in a child, and the, and the presenting problem can be, you know, my child is having temper tantrums. Um, a child may even have like an ADHD or some kind of you know behavioral diagnosis, and where this is really important 
the same set of child behavioral problems can be caused by either insufficient parental hierarchy or an excessive parental hierarchy. So, and in which case you would have two very different treatments for what would be, you know, the same complaint, you know, my child is having temper tantrums. Because parents who are permissive, their child have temper tantrums, have ch temper tantrums because those temper tantrums get the parents to do what they want. And, and so the child then ends up kind of running the show. And then, in an ex you know, a parent who has a very authoritarian style, some kids will, in response to an authoritarian parent, just rebel a lot more. And so they throw a lot of tantrums too, but it is because they are rebelling against the rules that are too strict. And so you would have two totally different treatment plans for, and two totally different ways of approaching these families. And that's why just knowing the basic symptom or having a diagnosis is really not enough to know how to successfully intervene as a therapist. And that's where this case conceptualization it just makes your life so much easier. And so, especially when working with kids, the hierarchy issue is generally a really number one place to start and get a sense of, you know, um, is there permissive parenting, authoritarian parenting, that you know, where this hierarchy is not, is in balance somehow. Sometimes you'll have one parent doing it, you know, authoritarian, another one being permissive, and obviously that's not working, and one of the reasons why the kid is is having difficulties. So the next thing you assess here are the emotional boundaries with children between the parents and the children. This comes out of structural family therapy primarily. Again, we're going to use the same terms as we did um, when assessing couple boundaries, the clear, enmeshed, and disengaged. But when looking at the parent-child relationship, enmeshed parenting often takes the form of more reactive parenting, and that's where the parent is so worried and so in, kind of entwined, the parent's identity is often so intermeshed with the child's that if the child is upset, the parent is upset. You know, and the parent will then do whatever it takes to get the child to calm down. This can take the form of very permissive boundaries. So, you know, I just want the kid to be happy, so I'm going to give him, you know, that candy bar at the checkout counter because it's just so much easier type of thing. Um, or, you know, every time the kid's upset, the parent reorganizes their whole life to make things work. So you will often see that. Reactive parenting can actually also take an authoritarian approach, too. So you can have an excessive hierarchy with enmeshed in the sense of um, when the child acts out, the parent feels so um, threatened as if the, the child is you know disrespecting them that they end up taking a very authoritarian response in a very reactive way um, with the child. So enmeshed can, can have either type of hierarchy um, related to it. Disengage parental boundaries um, generally take the form of being disinterested or not responsive enough to the child's needs. Um, so generally you're going to uh, not see permissive parenting with disinterested, well I guess you could actually, disinterested parent who just doesn't, is permissive because they don't want to work that hard to, you know, and to set boundaries and limits and it's, it's more disinterested and disconnection is why they're permissive. And the authoritarian disinterested parent is more the classic disengaged thing where they're just laying down rules. They're not really, don't want to hear from their kid. They're not worried about that. Dad's, dad has spoken. Mom has spoken. This is how it is. And there is this real emotional distance from the child. So this is also very helpful to assess um, in terms of how each of the parents are connecting emotionally with their children. Now the problem interaction cycle is assessed the same way with families as it is with parents. Of course, there's just usually more people involved, so it's a little more complex. And so you're looking at how A affects B and B responds to C and D and how everyone's interacting. And again, what you're going to do is start with the description of when the problem starts to arise, the first behavioral description of that. Get behavioral descriptions of how each person is responding to the other and keep going and keep going. Normally people just want to tell you the first half, you know, well, you know, he starts throwing a temper tantrum when I tell him to do his homework, you know, and then I tell him to go to his room. You know, you're not done hearing the end of the problem interaction sequence. Well, what, what does he do in his room, goes into his room? You know, how is dad responding to this? You know, how, when you get him out of the room, what happens then? And, you know, how do you guys get back to normal? So keep asking those questions until everyone's hunky-dory again. Um, they've returned to their family homeostasis and things are back to normal. So the next area to assess in this parental subsystem are triangles and coalitions. 
these are especially highlighted in the approaches of structural, strategic, and symbolic experiential. And so a triangle or a coalition are when two people are in a relationship, in order to stabilize the tension in their relationship, you know, there's differences, tensions, difficulties, they draw in a third person. And some people will conceptualize a triangle as triangulating in a third thing, such as alcohol or work. But so there are two people who are in relationship and they stabilize their relationship. They're drawing in a third person. The most classic form of this is the cross-generational coalition, um, and where there is a parent who colludes with a child against a third against the other parent. Now this collusion can is usually not conscious or intentional, although in divorcing families it becomes much more conscious and intentional. But oftentimes the most classic form of cross-generational coalition is when a mother becomes emotionally much closer to her children than she does to her husband who may be gone working long hours. And so she ends up over-investing and, and being on the side of the child where the parental, parental and couple boundaries are getting weaker and weaker and there's more disengagement between the couple and the mother becomes enmeshed with the kids. So that's the classic form of cross-generational uh, coalition one you frequently see. Um, and a lot of people come to therapy nowadays around the issues of a divorce where typically you will see triangulation, at least one triangle, if not two, three, or multiples. And often that is actually the number one thing to focus on with a, with a divorcing family is to interrupt the, the parents' attempts to get the children on their side against the other parent. And because that, that is the most destructive dynamic um, when families divorce. And so if there are triangles functioning in the family, it's very important that you A, try to identify them through this case conceptualization, and B, interrupt those um, as soon as possible because they can be very destructive um, to the functioning of the family system. It is also possible that other people can be easily triangulated into a family system, a friend, a grandparent, a co-worker, a lover, all of these types of triangles can really um, wreck havoc with the functioning of the family system because if a person um, you, is, use, has a dysfunctional triangle that's developed, they are using this outside person to stabilize the relationship without going back to the original person to make up and resolve their differences and work through things. And that's one of the forms that triangles take. So it's very important to make sure that triangles are identified and addressed. And again, in either step families and divorcing families, this is one of your primary um, areas for intervention. So finally, with the um, family assessment, you're going to look at the communication stances of all the different family members. The parents may or may not use the same stances they use in their marriage or um, partnership. Um, as they do with their children, often they do though, and you can look at how the kids often may pick, will be aligned with either one or the other parent's um, communication style. So it can be very interesting to look at the different communication styles within the family. So this next section of the um, assessment is where you develop the hypothesis. And um, this is kind of where you're going to be summing up a lot of what we've just been talking about and kind of picking out the most salient elements. Now, developing a hypothesis is, it is one of the more difficult parts of this um, case conceptualization because you're going to be pulling together the most important elements of what you've kind of assessed up to this point. And the basic concept behind um, a systemic hypothesis is that the symptom actually plays a role in maintaining family homeostasis. Even if the family doesn't like it, and they don't like this, they don't like the symptom itself, but it is kind of being used in some way to maintain the sense of family normalcy and balance. And so, and so that is where there are several different ways to kind of work with this um, systemic hypothesis. And one of the ways um, it comes out of the MRI approach, and they're look, trying to use the client language and client metaphors to help develop um, some way of reframing this, the role of the sy symptom in maintaining the family structure. So, for example, if the family is into sports and sporting metaphors, 
Um, the, the therapist might use this sports type metaphor to describe how the family is divided up into different teams and that by doing this, you know, it creates some kind of family sense of normalcy um, and a back and forth and a give and take and that and, um, and so they would frame it. Sometimes they even go so far as to say as, and if the family loses this sense of being on different teams, it might either create confusion or not so much a sense of belonging, and so we'd have to work on how to figure out how to deal with that. Um, another way of developing a systemic hypothesis is the Milan approach, and they use an approach where they that's called positive connotation and what they did is they looked at whatever the symptom was and they found some way to put a positive connotation and basically highlight um, the positive role that the symptom is playing in keeping the family stable so a classic way to uh, reframe using the positive connotation is to say that the child's you know symptom whether it's temper tantrums or a physical symptom is their way of keeping the parental the parents kind of united on the same front, reducing the marital conflict, because whenever the child is in distress, the parents actually come together, work together to solve the child's, you know, issues or whatever might be going on for the child. And so kind of reframing how the child is kind of the martyr in this case in terms of keeping the family together. So that's a classic positive connotation of the symptom in Milan therapy. The strategic therapists um, often use metaphors specifically of power and love. And as I went along, they ended up, um, especially Chloe and Madonna's, ended up preferring the uh, love metaphors in terms of reframing things as, as this is how someone is expressing love within the family. And so that, um, that these arguments that are going on back and forth is one way of expressing love and then also maybe highlighting some of the power dynamics within that also. So different approaches came up with different ways of highlighting um, and, and developing a systemic hypothesis that's kind of looking at the role of the symptom in the family. The main thing you don't want to do with the systemic hypothesis is to blame one member of the family because that is the opposite of the idea of the systemic hypothesis. The systemic hypothesis is never that, well, if dad was just less angry and less verbally abusive, you know, the problem, the family would be fine. That is not a systemic hypothesis. That is a blaming hypothesis and not looking at the role of why, how the father's anger um, is part of the systemic dance and it's not highlighting how each person in the system um, is part of that dance and so a lot of what you're doing with the systemic hypothesis is looking at the the pattern of systemic interaction and helping the family come up with a way to language this dance that they have that's maintaining homeos um, um, maintaining homeostasis so some examples um, of typical types of um, Hypotheses are that the child problem is serving to unite the couple and keep the couple on the same page and, and or distracted from their couple issues and or giving them a focus to have to keep them from being bored with their own lives. Um, and you can look at arguing in terms of keeping the sparks alive in a relationship or maintaining a safe distance to avoid intimacy. Um, using depression um, to help maintain to get power in a system. So, you know, the, the fact is that oftentimes uh, someone who might be depressed or having a physical ailment, they wield a unique sense of power in the system. And maybe you can frame it that, you know, maybe the mother's depression is the only way she can get power in this system, take control of her life, because otherwise, you know, her husband is trying to control too much of, of what she's doing. So, <clears throat> so this is where you can, um, these are some examples of how to use and develop a, a systemic hypothesis. And as you can imagine, it takes a lot of practice to get good at this. And the main thing to remember is that you want to try not to blame anyone and to, in some way in your hypothesis, to characterize each person as having, is doing either their best or not under, you know, to have some benevolent frame for each person, um, especially if you're going to try to deliver this directly to the family. In this next section um, is the intergenerational pattern section. And here you will identify information you may have, have gotten from doing a genogram. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But identifying any history within the family, uh, within a three or four generation pattern of substance or alcohol abuse, 
um, sexual, physical, or emotional abuse within the various uh, family systems, looking at the parent-child relationship patterns, because oftentimes a parent-child relationship dynamics, you know, either authoritarian or distant or over-enmeshed or over-involved, you know, you will often see these um, going across uh, different generations. Looking at physical and or mental disorders that might be going across, you might have a family system where there's a history of bipolar, schizophrenia, heart disease, diabetes, these sorts of things can be helpful to put onto the um, gen genogram. And looking at any historical incidents of the presenting problem, if you have a child who, um, you know, is acting kind of rebellious, you often will find that there might be this pattern across different generations. Um, if there's a divorce in the family, it's often very helpful to be aware of how those other divorces went. And also to identify any family strengths that uh, might be readily identified across generations. So in terms of identifying, uh, identifying intergenerational patterns, you can do this verbally and ask about each of these different areas. Um, you can also use a genogram, and this, um, the basics of this are described in the book, and uh, Monica McGoldrick also has a book on and goes into a lot more detail on how to generate a, a genogram. But I will tell you, genogram is one thing where I often, I kind of have to twist most of my students' arms to do it the first time. And once they do it, they always come back, almost with this, this hint of surprise in their voice, like, wow, that was like really helpful. And I, I always go, well, I, I wouldn't have asked you to do it if I didn't think it would be helpful. But for a lot of um, people, it really helps to go back and get that three-generation genogram. And I highly recommend if ever you feel like you're a little bit stuck to go back and do a genogram because sometimes you'll find something in that nice structured way of asking questions, you know, whether it's in the past or just even in this current family system, oftentimes um, useful, very useful information that you wouldn't necessarily gather otherwise comes to light. Now in this next section, we're going to assess both previous solutions um, that did work and that didn't work. And here we kind of cross over from more traditional systemic therapies into postmodern therapies. In terms of assessing what did not work, this comes out of the MRI approach. And they like to assess what have clients been trying to do to solve the problem and, and why have these attempts been failing? And is there a common pattern in terms of these various failed attempts to solve the problem? And so in, in MRI work, they would work at doing a 180 shift. So, for example, if parents had been trying to, um, you know, heap on heavier and heavier consequences of punishments and longer punishments and longer timeouts and longer, you know, more and more, you know, toys have been removed from the child, uh, if that was not working, they would try a 180 shift um, and to see if, you know, a, a different approach that might maybe be more emotionally in tuned rather than focusing on the consequences and, punish and heavy punishment might be more effective with the child. Alternatively, it's helpful to, to ask about what has been working, what does work. And this comes out of solution focus and narrative therapies. And oftentimes, kind of like ass assessing strengths, this is a bit tougher because clients are often less aware of when their problems are less of a problem because they're actually here to talk about the problem and they often don't notice when it's not a problem and sometimes even when it's less of a problem. And so um, in narrative they kind of frame this as unique outcomes so when could the problem have arisen and this, you know instead of having the problem they had this unique outcome of a positive ending. Um, and oftentimes I find the best way to assess this is to ask for when is the problem less of a problem, when is it less severe, um, less noticeable, and that oftentimes gets a better response from people because it's, it's hard to notice when the problem is not a problem. But sometimes people will be very clear and aware of when it could have been a problem and it wasn't or if they're very clear certain circumstances like this problem only happens with the mother, it never happens with the father. That, and that piece of information obviously is very helpful and telling in and of itself. So this next section um, in terms of narrative and dominant discourses also gets into diversity issues. And so this is a little bit tough to get used to storing and writing out, but once you do, I think it gets, um, it's, it's pretty easy and very interesting section to complete. So in this section, you're going to start by assessing dominant discourses in which the problem is embedded. And this comes out of narrative and collaborative ther therapies. So dominant discourses are those um, broad social d 
discourses, ways of thinking and looking at and defining what it means to be human, what it means to be normal, and what it means to have a problem. And so these often very much quickly come into informing um, our sense of having a problem, A, and then who we are because of that problem. And so here you want to start looking at kind of breaking this down because we're all embedded in multiple social discourses about who we are as people and what our problems are and how they fit into the world. So you want to start by looking at some of the cultural, ethnic, socioeconomic, and religious um, discourses that are informing the person in terms of what their problem is or is not, um, what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing, what is their value as a person. And so you, every client should have something to put onto this line in terms of just looking at who they are in, in the social economic structures in which they live and the cultural structures in which they live and how this is affecting their sense of identity and or their understanding of the problem. Next, you want to look at the gender and sexual orientation issues. Um, and this is an interesting one because oftentimes people are like, oh, there are no gender issues, there's no sexual orientation issues. I mean, there is always a gender issue. Gender is always informing how we see ourselves. And so this is a very interesting one because I think once you do a few assessments and you begin noticing uh, this element, you will see how oftentimes many of the problems are very closely related to gender stereotype norms. So you want to spend some time thinking about how the gender, how, uh, how the problem and gender roles are affecting um, both the individual, the couple, and the family, because gender is very much at the heart of couple family issues. And then finally, you want to look at any broader contextual um, discourses, family discourses, community discourses. You know, for example, kids who are at a school, that is such a powerful context that very much informs who they are, how parents see themselves, whether they see themselves as good enough parents or not, and um, looking at the family. So th these family discourses, kind of you can get these out of your genogram or inter intergenerational family assessment also, but most families have very strong um, ideas about who we are, when we have problems, who we should be, who we shouldn't be. And so those are also play very, are very important when people are coming into therapy, dealing with a problem, to look at what their family is saying about the problem specifically and who they are more generally. And oftentimes people live in communities, religious communities, often have a lot of both social politics and even, and then also um, religious beliefs about who we should be, what our problems are, what they mean. And so taking a time to step back and look at the problem and the identity of people and the you know how people are assessing themselves uh, and assessing their value as a human being through these various um, social discourses and lenses in ways of looking at what's going on in their lives. Now this next section is often tricky the first few times you you do it um, because it's it's a little bit foreign to think of things this way but again drawing on the narrative and collaborative approaches one of the questions that they ask in these therapy models is what does how is this problem informing the person's identity and their sense of who they are how does a problem inform um, how significant others are seeing themselves and so looking at the effect that the problem has on that person's identity um, and, and, and how others are seeing them because of this. And so looking at the effect can be very, very telling because oftentimes, um, you know, a parent may, you know, be struggling with a child's behavior and feeling like a failure as a parent or feeling like they're not as good or, you know, by having depression, it, it makes them feel like they're broken and, you know, you know, there's some, I've had people who have been diagnosed with like bipolar who feel like they have this incurable disease that makes them disabled for the rest of their lives. And so people can have very power, I mean the effects of problems can have very powerful effects on people's identities. And so there's always something to write here because being in a position where you need to go seek professional help for a problem always affects the identity in usually very significant ways. And this last section here on local discourses, that's a person's personal truth. So what is the client's story or view of the problem? What are the local or personal truths that are most evident in maintaining the problem and or may serve as a resource for solving the problem? So in this section, you're going to be writing a lot about what's going on subjectively for the client in terms of what they believe about what's going on in their life. 
So in this final phase here, we're going to be look, creating a genogram. And in this a genogram, and this is you can look up how to do this in the book itself, but you're going to be kind of mapping out. It's a visual map of the who's in the family, their ages. You can put in their names. You start marking down and noting any relational patterns. It's helpful to put occupations or medical history or psychiatric disorders, abuse history, that sort of thing on um, the genogram. I also like to put... Uh, three adjectives for each of the main people in the family system we're dealing with because that often gives me a really um, good sense of what's going on and who's who and who's what uh, in the system. In a genogram you're going to be creating on usually a separate piece of paper. I highly recommend you use a pencil not a pen. I end up erasing quite a bit and after you do a few you'll, you'll, you'll learn some of the strategies of how to kind of lay it out so that you can fit everyone on but it's a very useful thing to do and as I mentioned before um, oftentimes you get information from a genogram more quickly and more easily uh, because it is so structured so it's often a very useful tool in your first few years especially of, of doing therapy. Now in this last section here you're going to be getting the client perspective and that's areas of agreement and disagreement and how you plan to work with the client based on their perspective. Now in most cases you will be discussing some of these key findings um, through your case conceptualization with your client in a language that they understand that's useful to them um, and it's going to vary and you will work with your supervisor to see um, what and how you're, you will be discussing with the client. But when you do so it's very important to reflect on areas of uh, disagreement and agreement either because you either when you discuss it directly or generally you can get a sense of what the client is also thinking and, and where they may agree or disagree with what you've um, been discussing. And so it's important that you think about this and try to remain open and flexible and correctable if there are areas of disagreement um, because your case conceptualization is just one description of what's going on that may be useful to help you under, you know, guide your treatment. And if you're finding that things aren't going the way you hoped and things aren't working quite the way you'd liked, um, it might be mean that you need to go back and revisit this document and be open. And you know, one of the first places to look at is where was the client really in disagreement with you? And maybe you need to listen a little, listen a little closer to that. Um, now that said, though. Once you have completed this case conceptualization, I know you're very tired at this point, and it's taken a bit of time. Like I said, this is not something to cram the night before it's due. It will take 10, 10 to 20 hours to do your first assessment. Um, it's a pretty involved document, but you have this nice, broad description of clients, of your clients. And I, when you're done, I highly encourage you to go back and identify two or three key dynamics that really you think are contributing the most or the most salient in your treatment and and I uh, challenge you to actually work with that a little bit and I bet you you'll see how many of these are interconnected and interrelated. For example, um, if you notice that there was a permissive parenting style and mesh boundaries, I'm betting that the you know problem interaction pattern um, is going to be one where the child is going to maybe throw a temper tantrum and the parent's going to cave in, they go back to homeostasis, something along. So those three things clearly, and, and I bet you the parent's a placator. There you go. So we got four of them, all, you know, very closely interrelated and interlinked together. And what you can do at this point is to identify maybe which one of those four assessment ways of describing what's going on is the most useful to you to kind of keep as an anchor and a focus for treatment. And so you can see how by working on any four of those you will be affecting all the others. And so hopefully if you have a good case conceptualization you'll see that many of these parts are very interrelated and that by working on two or three of these you are going to resolve most of the other ones. So. So anyway, you have now completed really the most difficult part of beginning your clinical paperwork for working with your clients, and hopefully you have a, you feel much more secure and confident in understanding what's going on, and I believe it'll be much easier to move forward both in treatment and with the rest of your documentation. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and found it helpful.